The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. In the last program, we were talking about the question Jesus asked the crowd concerning what they were really looking for when they went into the wilderness to see John the Baptist. Well, proceeding from that point, the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And what are they like? He said, they're like children, they're like kids, sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, we have piped unto you and you have not danced, we have mourned to you, you have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. You say, he's got a devil. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, behold, a gluttonous man, a wine-bibber, a wino is the word we use today, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Well, we can compare that passage of Scripture with Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. Quote, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. They said to Jesus, are you he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and show John again those things which you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. And he said, What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Jesus added, Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. In other words, if you're looking for that, you went to the wrong place. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say to you, and more than a prophet, but this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before my face, which shall prepare the way before you. Truly, I say to you, among them that are born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding. He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is that Elias which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the markets, calling to their fellows, saying, We have piped to you, and you have not danced. We have mourned to you, and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man, a wine biber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you see any difference in those two accounts from the Gospels? Most people would answer no. However, there is a difference that is hidden in the language in which the Gospels were written. Well, first, let's go back to John. If we take John's question as to whether Jesus was the Christ at face value, then we certainly can't find his struggle unnatural. However, I don't see the question quite as simply as many see it. We should recognize there are two words in the Greek for the English word another, as in the case where John asked, quote, or do we seek another? One of these words is allos, meaning totally different, other. And one is heteros, meaning another in tandem with you, 
And that's about the best way I can explain it. The Jews had been expecting two messiahs, Messiah of Aaron and Messiah of David, a priestly figure and a kingly figure. And in one sense, John is saying to Jesus, are you both officers in one person or are these two officers held by different persons, one per each? Now, Matthew in his gospel uses the word heteros, while Luke in his gospel uses the word alos. And maybe Matthew understands a Jewish subtlety that Luke the Greek does not. John believed both messiahs were coming, but maybe one would follow the other as Jesus had followed John. And as far as John could see, Jesus was acting more like Messiah of Aaron, while what John was hoping for was Messiah of David. Now, oftentimes, men of God uh, like what Jesus said about John. Quote, he was a bright and shining light, and you were pleased for a season to walk in that light. And the critical word in that text is the word season. Now, we should realize that the greatest man born of woman had a brief and tragic life, a sad calendar of disaster and eclipse. And though thousands flocked to hear John, his power and influence paled even before Jesus came forth in his fullness. John must have felt very early on, and this is a bitter thing for any human heart to feel, that his mission in life was over and there was nothing appreciable left for him to do. And I think this also points up the fact that we can have traditional ideas about our faith that are not in the Bible, even though the majority of believers believe them. And this can lead to heartbreak and despair. And we have to be very careful about what I will call pop Christianity. What is popular preaching today may be absolutely wrong. Well, similar moments of heartbreaking despondency had happened in the lives of John's greatest predecessors. It happened to Moses and Elijah. But the case was far worse for John the Baptist than for them. For though his friend and savior was living and at no great distance from him and was at the full tide of his influence and was daily working miracles which attested to his mission, yet John the Baptist saw his friend no more. Jesus was not on John's horizon. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations, and it all begins with native missionaries. Called by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners, often facing hostile opposition they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs. World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, child care, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. Well, Jesus did not visit John in the course of his ministry. John in prison was surrounded by the indifference of listeners, whose curiosity had waned, and by the jealousy of disciples, 
whose John's main testimony to the Christ had disheartened. Well, finally came the terrible climax. Herod Antipas had flung John into prison as a concession to the hatred of Herodias for denouncing their adulterous lifestyle. Well, what was John's prison like? You know, I have visited a lot of prisons in Texas. Let me tell you, they are not pleasant places. Many are way overcrowded, but ancient prisons were nothing like modern prisons. I have visited ancient prisons in Viking castles in Denmark. They were damp, cold places that quick, quickly wrecked man's health as they were intended to do. John was imprisoned in the fortress of Macurus or Macor, a strong, gloomy castle built by Alexander Janius and strengthened by Herod the Great. The castle lies on the borders of the desert to the north of the Dead Sea and on the frontiers of Arabia. Now enough is known of solitary castles and eastern dungeons to know what horrors must have been involved for any man in such a place. The possibility of agonizing torture and the daily risk of a violent and unknown death. I've also been to the Tower of London and I've seen the devices designed to put and hold a man in positions of horrible pain. And those like Guy Fawkes went into the Tower of London, a strong man came out totally broken man. I've been to the Forbidden City in Beijing and I declined to see the film depicting the death of a thousand cuts. The Chinese knew exactly how to prolong human suffering to the ultimate. It seems that Satan has delighted in inspiring men to torment and destroy other men. Satan now took his opportunity to pay special attention to John the Baptist. But beyond physical suffering, how often have the most dauntless spirits been crushed by hopeless imprisonment? When the first noble rage and even resignation is over, when endurance is corroded by forced inactivity, when the great heart is cowed by despair of a life left to rot away in the darkness, who can be surprised by the depths of depression to which men can sink? You know, I think one of the saddest things I have ever seen is old men in Texas prisons. You can look at these men and see hopeless institutionalization has set in. They are alone with nothing in common with the other inmates. And you wonder what crime they committed so long ago that merited such endless punishment. All they have is prison and themselves. And any family or friends they ever had are gone, and they are forgotten and unvisited. But John's imprisonment must have been a deadlier thing to him than some of the more modern saints, such as Savonarola, Jerome of Prague and Martin Luther, who were also imprisoned in Florence, Constance and Warburg. John was an outdoors man to whom confinement was worse than death. Now he had the chilling damps and the cramping fetters of a dungeon. Now more than once in the world's history has God made his grandest servants drink the dregs of the cup of apparent failure long before a distant view of their work had become visible. Some seemed flung aside like broken vessels before being posthumously crowned with the immortality of success and blessing, which fools had regarded as madness and dismissed with dishonor. Now we may regard this as purifying fire and to no one could it have come in such terrible disguise as to John. John must have felt himself neglected not only by God above, but by the living Son of God below. And while John was pining in Herod's prison, fastened to one of those iron stakes whose wall holes can still be seen by the tourists, Jesus was preaching to rejoicing multitudes among mountain lilies or from the pleasant waters of the Galilee. And John must have asked why his father in heaven and his friend on earth allowed him to languish like this. Had he not been faithful? Had his testimony not been true? Why didn't Jesus call fire down from heaven to shatter his stony cell? And among so many miracles, couldn't Jesus spare just one?
for his friend and witness? Among so many words of mercy and tenderness, could he not even get one or two? Couldn't Jesus have sent at least one of those legions of angels to just free him? Well, Jesus didn't directly answer John's question, which was, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? What Jesus did was to allow John's messengers to see some of the works which until now they had only heard about. And with that went any possibility that what had been reported to John was an exaggeration. Jesus then made a reference to Isaiah 61 and told them to take back to John the message that the blind saw, the lame walked, lepers were cleansed, the dead were raised, but above all that glad tidings were preached to the poor. Then Jesus added the words that have rung down through the centuries, and blessed is he who shall not be offended in me. Jesus was saying, blessed is he who shall trust me in spite of sorrow and persecution and knows that above the rest, this note will swell. My Jesus has done all things well. Although the scriptures say nothing more, I think we can assume that John's disciples did not depart without hearing other words of love and concern for the grand prisoner whose end was quickly approaching. At Salome's request, John's head would soon be struck from his body, brought to the banquet on a golden platter. What they did with John's body is not recorded, but I have seen graves on prison grounds in Texas marked only by an inmate's number. John probably did not even get that little dignity. Well, as soon as John's disciples were gone, Jesus uttered the memorable eulogy that John was indeed the promised voice of a new and a nobler day, the greatest of all God's heralds, the, the Elijah who preceded Messiah. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries, Right now, we have many Native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you, who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this Native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a Native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles, Simply call us at with which Jesus identified John the Baptist as the messenger, the forerunner of Messiah. And we'll quote him again. What went you out into the wilderness to gaze on? Which means visit, look closely at. A reed shaken by the wind? Obviously no. But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went you out for to see? And the word means be aware, consider, understand. A prophet? 
Yes, I say unto you and far more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before my face or thy face, who shall prepare the way before me. Now there is a message in the Greek hidden to the English reader. John's listeners may have gone as curiosity seekers, but an awareness came over them as to who John really was. It was a case of some came to mock and stayed to worship, and some came to look and depart and forget. Well, after pronouncing this eulogy on John, Jesus started to speak to them more calmly and deliberately about himself and John. If they had experienced an awareness about John, Jesus was confirming and deepening it, and in so de doing, Jesus said something that has puzzled and troubled Christians for centuries. Jesus said that although John was the greatest of the old dispensation, yet he who was little in the kingdom of heaven was greater than John. Well, how do we understand these words? The brevity of the statement leaves its meaning uncertain. I personally think the superiority mentioned is superiority in spiritual privileges. There's an old legal saying that goes like this, the least of that which is the greatest is greater than the greatest of that which is least. And as far as revealed knowledge, the illimitable hope, consciousness of our closeness to the Father in heaven, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the humblest child of the new covenant is more richly endowed than the greatest prophet of the old. That is beyond question. And into this kingdom of heaven, whose advent Jesus now proclaimed, those who heard Jesus could press with holy violence. Well, many who heard the words of Jesus, and especially the publicans and those who were the scorned, as the Jews called them, people of the earth, or the priests and Levites and Pharisees called them, they accepted these words about John with joy. But the accredited teachers of the oral tradition and the law listened to those words with contemptuous dislike. Well, Jesus was struck by this contrast and drew an illustration about peevish children who reject every effort of their companions to amuse or delight them. They didn't like the flute and dance of the children they didn't like the long simulated wails of mourners at funerals. True goodness in no kind of dress would please them. God's richly variegated wisdom had been manifested to them in many fragments and by many methods, and yet all in vain. John came to them in the stern asceticism of a hermit, and they called John mad. He's crazy. Jesus joined the banquet and the marriage feast they called him a wine guzzler, a glutton. Jesus added as a warning and a test that wisdom is justified over her children, or other words, wisdom is justified by what it produces, its results and its offspring. Well, according to the narrative of Luke, it would appear that before the events of the day were concluded, Jesus received and accepted an invitation from one of the Pharisees who bore the common name of Simon. Well, perhaps this event occurred at Magdala, or perhaps at Nain. We don't know the detail. Really, we don't need to know it. Why Simon invited Jesus to his home, we don't know either. We do know that Jesus had not yet come to an open rupture with the Pharisaic party, and maybe Simon was enterprising thought Jesus might make a docile instrument for their social and political purposes. Regardless, Simon was motivated partly by curiosity, partly by a desire to receive a popular teacher, and perhaps partly to show a distant approval of something that had struck him in the words and ways of Jesus. Now, it's probably extremely difficult. In fact, there's no doubt about it. It's extremely difficult for modern Westerners to realize how very different Jesus was to the religious set of his day. Now, it seems clear that the hospitality that Simon offered was meant to be qualified and condescending, because there's no mention of all the ordinary attentions an honored guest would receive. They were coldly omitted. Now, Jewish 
leaders and religious people in the days of Jesus loved to put on a show of righteousness. And upon sighting each other and approaching, they extended their hand palms out and made extravagant bows of courtesy as they got closer and closer. Well, the lack of any such show by Simon clarified where he stood. There was no water for weary feet. There was no kiss of welcome on the cheek. There was no perfume for the hair. There was nothing but a somewhat ungracious admission to a vacant place at the table. And the most distant of courtesies usually managed so any guest might feel he was receiving an honor we're missing. Well, we read all about this in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 40. Quote, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet to food. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, bag, an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, began to wash his feet with tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisees, which had bidden him, saw it, Simon spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And then come some of the most classic words, in my opinion, in the Bible. When Jesus looked at Simon and said, quote, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And Simon said, Say on, Master. World Missionary Evangelism's missions often extend beyond normal methods of Christian outreach. For generations, we have built farms and taught the skills needed to sow and reap. With operations ranging from crop farming to livestock, poultry, and even fish production, WME adapts our agricultural outreach to meet the strengths of the area and the needs of its people. For decades, World Missionary Evangelism Farm Missions have provided not only a business income for the poor, but the food produced on those farms is often used in our feeding programs and by our children's homes. The importance of this ministry and what it produces cannot be overstated as it opens the door for us to share the gospel. Thus, even in farming, the evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of the name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is the heart of our work.